Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 13. And would you stand with me, please? I just felt the AC come on. Are you getting a little bit too chilly? Is it all right? No, we just got red ready anyway when it's 30 degrees below zero. You, <laughs> Of course it's not too cold. Matthew chapter 13. There are eight parables in Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to see the similarity of at least the first three of these parables in our message today. We find the, the sower, the parable of the sower in verses 1 through 23. We have the, sower, they have the parable of the wheat and the tares in verses 24 through 43, and the parable of the good fish and the bad fish in verses 47 through 50. Um, now let me just read the first one. The same day when Jesus out, went, went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into the ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell among the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up, and choked them. But others fell unto good ground, and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he that hath more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even away, even that he hath. Therefore I speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand stand and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive for this people's heart is wax gross and their eyes are dull of hearing and their ears they've closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and be and should be converted and I should heal them but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear for verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and the understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon, or immediately, with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended." He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and to become unfruitful. But he that receives seed under the good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And then the wheat and the tares, and then, of course, a little bit later on, the good fish and the bad fish. You may be seated. Each of these parables has the same basic theme. And the basic theme is this. The separation of those who see from those who do not. Of those who have no root excuse me, of those who have root from those who do not, of those who understand from those who do not, those who are genuine 
from those who are not. That is the basic theme of these three parables in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew Henry wrote some great commentary on this chapter. I'm going to quote a couple of excerpts from his commentaries. And I hope that, again, he wrote back in the 1800s. And uh, sometimes whenever we in our modern um, English try to read some of these earlier writers, we, you know, we, we lose them because, not because they didn't write well, it's because it, our English has deteriorated over the years and we don't read as well uh, or speak as well for that matter as, uh, as they did years ago. Uh, and it's amazing, isn't it? Back in those days, we did not have a Department of Education in Washington, D.C. How did they ever learn anything? Listen to what Matthew Henry says here. We do not find that any of the scribes or Pharisees were present. They were willing to hear him when he preached in the synagogue, but they thought it below them to hear a sermon by the seaside, though Christ himself was the preacher. And truly, he had better have their room than their company. For now they were absent. He went on quietly and without contradiction. Note, sometimes there is most of the power of religion where there is the least of the pomp of it. The poor receive the gospel. When Christ went to the seaside, multitudes were presently gathered together to him. Where the king is, there is the court. Where Christ is, there is the church, though it be by the seaside. Note, those who would get good by the word must be willing to follow it in all its removes. When the ark shifts, shift after it. The Pharisees had been laboring by base calumnies, that means slander, and suggestions to drive the people off from following Christ, but they still flocked after him as much as ever. Note, Christ will be glorified in spite of of the opposition. Now, I don't know whether you caught that. It was really a brilliant piece of deducement by Matthew Henry. There is a very important lesson here. There is no power to change people or change circumstances or change a country in the tapestry of religion. I see, I see the smoke beginning to billow up. Let me repeat that. There is no power to change people or circumstances or country in the tapestry of religion. The Pharisees had religion up to their eyeballs they had no power to change anyone, any circumstance, much less their nation. They were spiritually dead. There is no power in the formalism of religion. There's no power in the tapestry of religion. There's no power in the organization of religion. It's not there. If it was there, America wouldn't be here. There are 300,000 evangelical Christian churches in the United States of America, and that is a conservative number. 300,000 of them. And yet, our country continues to spiral downward into oppression and tyranny. Where is the salt among the church? Where is the power to produce anything of a life-changing nature within the church of America today? It's not there. 
Jesus taught his greatest lessons, performed his greatest works when the Pharisees were not around. When the Pharisees were not there, Jesus did his greatest miracles, brought his greatest messages, performed his greatest works. The Pharisees were a stumbling block to the work of Christ. And the Pharisees of America in 2012 are a stumbling block to the work of Christ in our country today. Let me give you a, a, a practical application to that. I don't know, I know how many times I've heard a, a well-meaning Christian say something along the lines of, well, all that America needs is to accept and then they fill in the blank with whatever their pet doctrine is. Well, you know, if we could just get all of America to accept Calvinism, we'd have a changed America. Boy, if we could just get America to accept the gifts of the Spirit, we could have a changed America. Boy, if we could just get all of America to get baptized, we could change the course of the country. And then, of course, I hear these, these pious preachers say all the time, well, the only thing that God's called me to do is preach the gospel. And as long as we just preach the gospel, we can change the country. Let me tell you something. If everybody tomorrow, if everybody in America tomorrow subscribed to whatever your particular doctrine is that you think is so important, America would not change. America is not going to change because you happen to be a Calvinist or an Arminian. It's not going to change because you go to church on Saturday or you go to church on Sunday. It's not going to change because we baptize by immersion or you baptize by sprinkling. The country is not going to change because of your particular pet doctrine. I, I have seen Calvinists that are absolutely worthless to the cause of liberty in America. And I've seen Calvinists who are great patriots in helping to fight for the cause of liberty in America. I've seen Arminians who are worthless to the cause of liberty in America. And I've seen Arminians who are very helpful to the cause of liberty in America. I've seen people who are sprinkled, who are worthless to the cause of liberty in America. And I've seen people who are sprinkled that are great patriots for the cause of America. I've seen people that have been dunked all the way under and they should have stayed under because they're no help to the cause of liberty in America. And I've seen people that have been immersed and they are great patriots in the cause of liberty in America. The, the, the question is not, what is your pet doctrine? What is your, the nuance of whatever you think is so important theologically for you to believe? What must happen for people to change? People go get baptized and they, and they get up from being baptized and they're just as mean and just as mean-spirited as they were when they got wet. And I've seen people speak in tongues and as soon as they start speaking English again, they're cussing out their neighbor. I've seen people go through the rites and the rituals of religion and as soon as they get out in the foyer, they are criticizing and gossiping against their fellow churchmen. 
What is the difference? What is the issue? What is the thing that causes people to change? What is the people that causes them to awaken? Look at verses 13 through 16. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing not, are they seeing see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. What has to happen? Think about it. These people in Jesus' day, they saw the miracles of Christ. Think about it. They saw lepers cleansed. They saw the blind given sight. They saw the deaf given uh, hearing. They saw the lips of those who could not speak begin to utter forth. They saw the limbs of those that could not walk stand and dance and, and, and run. They saw those who had been dead in the grave risen from the dead. They saw his miracles. And it changed them not one bit. They heard his sermons, the greatest sermons ever given in the history of mankind were given by our Lord. The great lessons, the great messages of truth coming forth from the Son of God. They heard him speak. They heard him preach, and it changed them not. They saw his power, and it changed them not. They felt his love. God is love. When Jesus walked on this earth, he was the personification of love. Amen? Amen? No one has ever loved like he loved. His heart was the, was the biggest heart of love that mankind has ever known. You could not get around Jesus and not know that he loved people. He loved the ones that no one else loved. He, loves, he loved the dirty people. He loved the poor people. He loved the down and out people. He loved the addicted people. He loved the immoral people. He loved people that society spurned and scorned. He loved people. He loved the prostitutes, the addicts. They felt his love and they were not changed. Let me tell you what, you can have your doctrine, you can have your baptism, you can have your gifts, you can have your Calvinism, you can have your Arminianism, you can have your theology and still be unchanged. With no life and no heart and no ability to make a difference in the world in which you live. What's the difference? Why couldn't they see it? Their minds were in a box. Their minds were in a box. Can you imagine? Jesus just healed a person of his blindness, and you can just hear, you can hear the Pharisees trying to explain that. Well, now, you know, wait a minute. Um, there, there, you know, there's got to be something wrong with it. This person probably had... Uh, something in their in their in their in their mind that you know just didn't click, and all of a sudden you know something happened, and they were able to, say, and they began to reason among themselves. And, well, did he really do that? Was that you know that person? How do we know they were really blind? I mean, they could be saying that they were blind and making it all, and you can just hear them as they tried to make some kind of excuse and some kind of an explanation that would fit their little box 
of what they understand and don't understand. People have their minds in a box. It could be a religious box. There's a lot of people that have a religious box. If, if you don't fit into their religious box, dot every I, cross every T, just like they do, then buddy, you are just all wet. You can't be right. There can be no blessing. You can't be of God. And they've got this little box that they put all of their religion in. They can't see anything outside the box. There's some people that have a political box. And they can't think of anything outside the political box. Some, to some people, the political box is called Republican. And if you're not Republican, they can't accept you, they can't appreciate you, they can't understand you, or Democrat, same thing. It's a box, they put everybody in. And if, boy, if you're out of the box, then it just can't be right, it can't be of God. Could be a social box, it could be a denominational box. But they think of the world in boxes. Everything's in a box. And anything that comes along, even Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, that doesn't fit their box, they dismiss it. And it means nothing to them. And they go on, life unchanged. The thing that makes the difference is some men have their eyes open to see, and some men have their eyes closed to not see. Some have their ears open to hear, others have their ears closed to hear. If a person will not open their eyes and open their ears, be willing to see something that is outside their sphere of understanding, outside their little box that they've created. They are never going to awaken to the miracle truth that Christ wants to bring to them and certainly they're never gonna be able to be used of God to bring hope and liberty to a dying people. Jesus was explaining to his disciples the difference between those who defect and those who do not, between those who stick it out and those who do not, from those who go forward and those who turn around and go back. He's explaining the great divide in the minds and the hearts of men and women. Liberty Fellowship, not everyone has an eye to see, and not everyone has an ear to hear, and we should not be dismayed when people turn their backs to the truth and walk in a different direction. We should not be dismayed and we should not even be discouraged. And I know that's difficult sometimes because some of the people that turn and go backward are people that you call your friend and people that you love and you have a natural affinity for. And you, when you see a friend or a family member or a loved one with their eyes closed and with their ears closed, and you see them not getting it, you see them turning back, you see them not being a part of what God is doing, then you begin to be discouraged, and of course we understand because we are people that are social creations, and we understand the importance of fellowship and friendship, etc. But let me tell you something. It is more important that I'm faithful to the truth that it is that I please my so-called friends. One reason, by the way, I got a call from the Los Angeles Times this week. I don't think the reporter heard what she wanted to hear. <laughs> so you may or may not see anything in the Los Angeles Times about 
the story. One of the reasons she asked me some questions about why, why the Flathead Valley. So I thought, well, I'm just going to use that as a, as a precursor to this message today. Why, why would we choose a place like the Flathead Valley of Montana? There are many reasons. Won't go into all of them in this address. Just in fitting with what we're saying. One reason was it's not, I repeat, it's not a warm weather location. It's not Arizona. It's not Southern California. It's not Florida. It's not Texas. If you're watching, it gets cold in Montana. You say that was really a consideration? Yes, it was. Why? Because with what's coming, we're not interested in people who make decisions based upon the weather. If you make a decision based upon weather, you don't want to come here. It's too cold for you here. You won't like it here. We chose the location because it's not a big, thriving industrial community. It's not Los Angeles or San Diego. It's not Dallas or Fort Worth. It's not Miami or St. Petersburg, Florida. There's not a job opportunity on every corner. You may have to work two or three jobs to make a living in the Flathead Valley of Montana. You may have to work a little bit harder than where you came from to make a living in Montana. It can get rough economically. It is rough economically. This is rough country. It's beautiful country, the most gorgeous. Mountainous views and valleys and rivers and streams and I've never seen anything so beautiful. That's what I see here. But it's rugged terrain. Can you imagine what it was like a hundred years ago? Can you imagine what it was like without the technology that we have today, without the, you know, the motorized engines and so forth that we use in our in our work today? Can you imagine what it was like to cut the timber and to mine the ore and so forth with with your hand and shovels and picks and lights and and horse-drawn buggies and I mean, can you imagine what? the people that lived here 100, 150 years ago in, endured this, the, the whole Western genre was a rough, tough culture. And usually it was only the rough, tough people that made it here. And so too many in, in today, let me just, I don't know, how can I say this? Montana is not for sissies. It's not for sissies. And in our modern culture today, everything is comfort and ease and success 
and money and how big is the mall? How many malls are there in town? How many stores can I shop? Where are the big restaurants? Everything is all, where are the entertainment? Where are the big drama, the big movies, the big rinks, the big entertainment theaters? Where, this is what people are attracted to today. If that's where you are, Go to Palm Beach. We are in serious circumstances as a country. There are things in front of us that are going to require men to be men and women to be women. It's going to require people with grit and backbone and determination and character and commitment. And if comfort and ease is what motivates you, this is not the place for you. And quite frankly, don't be offended. That's not what Liberty Fellowship is all about. We knew that if we would have gone to any of these warm weather places, these big metropolitan areas, with all of these tapestry of social condition, we knew that people would be attracted to that, people would love that, people would want to be a part of that. Oh yeah, let's go to Southern Arizona and just suffer for Jesus. <laughs> let's go to Hawaii and suffer for Jesus. Oh, I didn't mean that. Roland's going to Hawaii tomorrow. <laughs> Do you get my point? We talked about this. We did. We talked about this. And we firmly believed and still do that the only people that are going to make a difference for the future of our country and the future of liberty are people who mean business. Amen. Verse 16 says it all. Jesus said, blessed are your eyes for they see, and your ears, for they hear. If you can't see, if your eyes are not opened, if you're still caught up in this liberal conservative paradigm, this Republican Democrat paradigm, you're still caught up in this establishment Fox News mantra that you hear day after day after day. Your eyes are still closed, your ears do not hear, and until your eyes are open and your ears are open, you're not going to get it. Liberty Fellowship is comprised of people, Montanans and immigrants who get it. And that's why they are here. There's basically two kinds of people. Some would say Democrats or Republicans. Some would say Chevy owners or Ford owners. Some would say cat people or dog people. Some would say truck people or car people. Some would say country people or city people. 
the two kinds of people are those who get it and those who don't and what's amazing about it to me it has nothing to do with what religion what denomination you are whether you go to church on Sunday or Saturday whether you dunk or sprinkle whether you speak in tongues or do not whether you believe God has predestinated you to go to heaven or you don't your eyes are open or they're not your ears are open or they're not either you get it or you do not Jesus said in verse 20 and 21, he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon or with, uh, immediately with joy receiveth it. Oh yeah, wow, this is what I want. This is great. I like it. I want it. Verse 21, yet hath he not root in himself, but he dureth for a while, but then tribulation or persecution comes and because of the word and he's offended, he falls away. Look, I want to know now the people who are not truly with us. I want to know now. If you're going to leave, leave now. I want to know now. If you don't like the preaching now, leave now. If you don't like the fellowship now, leave now. If you don't like cattle spell, leave now. If you don't like the weather, leave now. If you don't like the job opportunities, leave now. If it's too hard for you, leave now. If you're offended and you got your feelings hurt, leave now. Let's find out as early as possible who is real and who is not, who is genuine and who is not, who is committed and who is not. Because when we're in the foxhole together, I want to know you mean business. Yeah. And if you can't take all this little petty stuff now, then now's the time to leave. I've been, I've been in the numbers game. I've been in the success movement. I've been in the church growth movement. I've read the books. I've read the magazines. I've been to the conferences. I've heard everything they've had to say. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. That's not what discipleship is all about. It's not what the liberty movement is all about. And it's not what liberty fellowship is all about. And it was never what Jesus was all about. What's the problem? They have no root. Jesus said, they hear the word, they hear the message. Oh, yeah, they want to be a part of it. And then something happens, persecution. They're offended. They leave. And Jesus said, they have no root. Listen to what Matthew Henry said about this. This is brilliant. Again, this is over, well over 100 years ago. They have no root in themselves. No settled, fixed principles in their judgments no firm resolution in their wills, nor any rooted habits in their affections, nothing firm that will either be the sap or the strength of their profession. Where there is not a principle, though there be a profession, we cannot expect perseverance. Those who have no root will endure but a while. A ship without ballast, though she may at first outsail the laden vessel, yet will certainly fail in stress of weather and never make her port. When trying times come, those who have no root are soon offended. They first quarrel with their profession. Listen, they first quarrel with their profession and then quit it. First find fault with it 
then throw it off, close quote. Wow, is that profound or what? Could that have been written in 2012 or what? Jesus talked about the scorching sun in verse 6. To those whose eyes are opened, the rays of the sun are warm and refreshing. To those whose eyes are closed, the rays of the sun are scorching and hot. People come, this dear man today came in here and said, man, I just got here, not even unpacked. I just had to get here in time for Liberty Fellowship. All the way from the state of Michigan. How many miles is that? 2,000 miles. But there's people that live across town. They'll come in and they'll hit the same service, the same preaching, the same fellowship, the same everything, and they'll walk out and go, man, I don't think I want to go back there. What's the difference? Some have their eyes open and some do not. Some hear with their ears and some do not. The scorching, the, to some the heat is scorching and hot and they've got to get away. To others, they come in and they close their eyes and they bask in, this, in the warmth of the rays of the sun and say, wow, is it ever good to be home. Paul just came in from Michigan this past week. I hugged him back here in the back of the, of the fellowship this morning before the service. And as he hugged me, he said, I'm home. <laughs> What's the difference? Some have eyes to see and others don't. Some have ears to hear and others don't. What caused it? Well, verse 22, He that also receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and become unfruitful. Now, two things here. The care of this world. The care of this world. The word care in the Greek literally means the distraction. The distraction of this world. Choke. Choke his vision, choke his, his growth, the distraction of the world. Well, what happens today? We got a world system and a world philosophy that many Christians are so enamored with, they cannot think outside the system of the world, the philosophy of the world, And they are, therefore, they are distracted by it, and they sacrifice their principles. Remember what Matthew Henry said? They sacrifice their principles because of this philosophy of the world that they're distracted with. Alan was telling me sometime years ago back in the other church, we sent a group of young people to a youth camp in South Carolina or North Carolina? North Carolina. And the preacher got up preaching to hundreds and hundreds of teenagers that were there from all over the southeast, mostly, at this big youth camp. And the preacher got up and he preached this terrific message, terrific message about how kids Kids, what you have to do is you have to be a Daniel. You have to do right no matter what. You have to resist peer pressure. And where kids are trying to tell you, hey, you got to do this. Now you've got to stand strong, kids. You got to be a man. You got to be a woman. You got to do right. A whole message, hour and a half, telling kids you got to resist all this peer pressure. You got to stand for what's right, stand for the principles. And I mean, it was a great message. And then at the end, he said, well, I guess we got to vote for John McCain because he's the only one that can win. If I'm lying, I'm dying. You know what he said? Duh. 
90 minutes on telling kids they got to do right no matter what. The founder, Bob Jones University, Bob Jones Sr., most famous quotation of all, do right if the stars fall, do right. Well, I guess we got to vote for Mitt Romney because he's the only one who can win. My point is, what's the problem? Why aren't their eyes opened? Why can't they see? Just like Jesus said, they have become distracted by the care of this world. The philosophy of the world says, you gotta vote for him because he's the only guy that can win. And all the little sheep go, yeah, ba ba ba. <laughs> Nobody else can win, we vote for him. You know something thinking about? If everybody said, if everybody voted for the guy that they say can't win, guess what? He'd win! That's just one example. Christians, they teach all these great Bible truths, but it's just theory. It's just theory. I'm talking about tongue speakers and non-tongue speakers. I'm talking about Calvinists and Arminians. I'm talking about the guys who were dunked and the guys who were sprinkled. Doesn't matter. They teach all this great theory, all these great doctrines, and then they turn right around. Well, gee whiz, I guess we gotta, I guess we gotta vote for him because he's the only one who can win. Do right if the stars fall or if Barack Obama becomes president. <laughs> right? We got to get rid of Barack Obama. No, what we got to do is we got to get rid of the blinders that are covering the eyes of the people that ought to know better. That's what we got to do. <laughs> Christians all over America are banning their principles for the sake of partisan politics. The lesser of two evils. You ever heard that one? Well, you know, yeah, we know he's a jerk, but he's not quite as bad of a jerk as the other jerk. Yeah, we know he's a crook, but he's not quite as bad of a crook as the other crook. And then, and then they get, then they get really spiritual on us. Well, Jesus is coming soon. You hope. What if he doesn't come soon? What kind of? legacy are you going to leave for your kids and grandkids? I'm just supposed to preach the gospel. Yeah, that's all John the Baptist did, right? Well, people just need to get right with God. You know what? I believe people ought to get right with God, and I'm a, I'm a preacher of the gospel, and I want to say to each and every one of you here, and those of you that are listening by videotape or live streaming, if your heart is not right with the Lord, if Christ is not your Savior, if you've not given Him your heart in your life, if you're not trying to live according to the principles that He has given us in His Word, I beg you to humble your heart before Christ. I beg you to give your heart to the Lord. I want to see you in heaven. I love your soul. And I want to see you saved. And I want to see you enjoy the blessings of Christ and the blessings of eternity. Yes, we need to get right with God. But if we truly get right with God, it also means we get right with truth. 
we get right with principle and we start sacrifice and we stop sacrificing our principles every time it's convenient or every time Fox News tells us that's what we're supposed to do all we gotta do is just teach sound doctrine well I believe in sound doctrine I have studied doctrine, taught doctrine all of my adult life. I think I know a thing or two about doctrine. I would rather have a guy whose doctrine may be off a little bit but his eyes are open, his ears are open, and he's thinking outside the box, and he's living by principles and not by expediency than a guy who dots every I and crosses every T just as we think he should, and yet he's dead as a doornail when it comes to standing for principle and truth. You're not going to get any two of us in a prolonged doctrinal discussion and we're going to agree on everything 100%. It ain't going to happen. Why, I bet, just a guess, that maybe some of you husbands and wives don't even agree with each other on everything. You think? Are we going to agree on everything? No. Do we have to agree on everything? No. Say it. No. no. These people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. They're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And we're losing our country while they're debating doctrine and while they're fighting one another on all of these issues that when we get to heaven will not matter to a hill of beans. I got news for you. There's not a Calvinist compartment and an Arminian compartment in heaven. There's not a section for those that were dipped and those that were sprinkled. There's not a section for those that spoke in tongues and those that didn't. And by the way, if you think, well, I heard a guy say one time, he was, he was asked, well, I, I actually, actually it was me, and this is back years. <laughs> I tried to get around this, but I'll just tell you. I, I was years ago, you got to understand, this was years ago. This was years ago. I was younger. And I was asked by a reporter one time, and she was kind of snooty, and she said, Oh, you're one of these preachers that believe that you're so narrow minded, you believe that only your group's going to go make it to heaven. And so I could, you know, I kind of fed off of her, her snootiness. And I said, I said, lady, I'm even more narrow-minded than that. I don't think all my group's going to make it. <laughs> oh, she didn't know what to say to that. But if you really think that only your group is going to be the ones that make it to heaven, let me tell you what, we don't need, where's all the mini mansions going? Because there's not that many of you. In my house are mini mansions. You know, heaven, as we understand it, is 1,500 miles cube. 
You go to Revelation, 1,200 furlongs, 1,500 miles. 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 15 miles, 1,500 miles deep or high. It's a cube shape. Talking about the New Jerusalem, the dimensions of the New Jerusalem. 1,500 miles in every direction, width, length, and breadth all the way up. Now think about that. I, got a, I, I did a study on this, and I, I talked about if you had a mansion on every corner, you know, how many streets of gold, how many miles of streets would you have? And I've got all this figured out. I've got it in my notes somewhere. How oh, many miles of street? You know, and you go this way, and you go this way, then you go up. And you got, if you go a mile, every, every mile is a floor, just using it theoretically. Every mile is a floor. And so you got all these many streets and all these many mansions on this floor. Then you go up 1,500 floors. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. But why does he need all those mansions? Because only you and your group are going. <laughs> Nobody else is going to be there. The Armenians aren't going to be there if you're a Calvinist. And if you're a, a Armenian, the Calvinists aren't going to be there. And if you're a tongue speaker, the non-tongue speakers aren't going to be there. And if you don't speak in tongues, the tongue speakers are not going to be there. And if you're a dipper, then the, then the sprinklers aren't going to be there. And if you're a sprinkler, the dippers aren't going to be there. And I mean, why do you need many mansions? You know, city cow spell could hold them all. <laughs> It's not, when we get to heaven, it's not going to matter to a hill of beans. But I tell you what it is. It is a tactic of Satan to divide us, to weaken us, to keep us from being effective in doing what it is we ought to be doing for the kingdom's sake. That's what's happened. The th second thing he said was, in verse 22, the deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches. What's the old saying? Follow, follow the money, follow the money. Well, you know, I'd come to Kalispell, but I just can't get rich there. Depends on what you mean by rich. I personally think that freedom is more valuable than gold. It all depends on your definition of riches, doesn't it? Did you see where... By the way, it doesn't mean... It doesn't mean a thing when a preacher looks at his watch, okay? It doesn't mean a thing, so don't get excited. Did you see where Congress has petitioned the Department of Transportation, I think it is, this past week, to get serious about building and, and incorporating drones over the continental United States? Well, you know, what, what we need in America, you know, the problem, we need more, we need drones over over the skies of America. You know, of course, you know what drones are. Anybody not know what a drone is? Target. That's right. You know, did you hear what I said? That's what Congress petitioned the Obama administration. It wasn't the Obama administration. It was Congress petitioning. Republican, Democrat, conservative. You know, just real quick, I'm, I'm proud of Denny Reberg for standing up for the Jesus statue on Big Mountain. I really am. I'm proud of him for that. I support him in that. And I was, I was glad to see all of our fellow Montanans come out like they did for the Jesus statue. 
I believe it ought to be there. I believe it has every right historically to be there. And I'm, I'm angry that these uh, atheist types want to try to deny the God-fearing people of a community their freedom of, of speech and expression when they erect a statue as they did so many years ago to welcome our World War II veterans uh, back home. I support him. I'm glad of that. But you know what? If we could get Denny Reberg and these so-called conservative Christians as excited and as exercised about preserving the fundamental liberties of our country as they are a Jesus statue, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. Amen. Come on. I'm all for the statue, but I am not all for drones flying over our town, Amen. taking pictures of us, videotaping our every move. The deceitfulness of riches follow the money. Well, there's a lot of people that are making money off of the drones. A lot of people making money off of the police state. A lot of businesses are getting rich off of the military industrial complex. It's not just Barack Obama. It's not just those mean evil Democrats. There's a lot of Republicans getting rich off of the New World Order. A lot of conservatives getting rich off of the police state. Businessmen, Christians, getting rich off of the sacrifice of our freedoms on the altar of big government. In fact, right now in the United States, the only thing, I don't care what you hear about the economy, whatever the news reports are, oh, we've had less unemployment, the economy is recovering, we're doing great. <laughs> the only thing that is growing today is business, uh, excuse me, is government and the businesses that are sucking at the teat of government. It's the only ones that are growing. Follow the money. And then real quickly, verse 23. Okay. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, understandeth it, beareth fruit, What's the distinction between the two? What's the distinction between the good ground and the stony ground and the thorny ground? What's the distinction? Do you see it? Verse 23, do you see it? What's the distinction? Fruit. Fruit. How do you know the one from the other? Fruit. Don't tell me, Mr. Republican conservative candidate, how much you believe in constitutional government, what are you going to do about constitutional government? Fruit. Not talk, not rhetoric, not lip service. Fruit. The distinction between the good ground and the thorny ground and the stony ground is fruit. By their fruit ye shall know them. Fruit is action. It is attitude. Now let me give you this quote. I'm almost done. Let me give you this quote. Fruit is not doing something in order to. Fruit is doing something because of. Let me say that again. I want you to, re I want you to remember that. Fruit is not doing something in order to. Fruit is doing something because of. If you're doing something in order to, from a Christian spiritual point of view, that's called works. And the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
from a patriotic, freedom-oriented point of view, it's not in order to, because there's a lot of people who have a mechanical action. Right? Thank you, Charity. It's a, right? It's, it's a mechanical action. It's to do, to do. Do this, do this, do this. Do this, do this. Right? How many people are there? That's all they know to do is just robot. Do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. Because of, it's entirely different. I fight for these principles because of my understanding of the principles for which I fight. I believe in this position because of my understanding and my eyes are opened to the truth that this position represents. And I take my stand on that position because of something I understand. If it's just, then as soon as the opposition comes, you're not gonna go why you have the position that you have, and I couldn't tell you how many, how many of these candidates I've heard talk, and after you get them past the 30 second sound bite, they can't tell you why they have the position they have. I'm pro-life and I'm pro-family. Huh. Wow, that's, that's a revelation. Have you ever heard any candidate, Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative, get up and say, vote for me. I'm pro-death and I'm anti-family. <laughs> vote for me, I'm a communist. I believe in the Constitution of the United States. Ask them a few questions and you find out that their understanding is about that deep. They don't get it. Their eyes are not open. Their ears are not open. They're still in the box. They don't get it. Fruit is not doing something in order to. Fruit is doing something because of. The love in our hearts moves us. The understanding of our mind moves us. The conviction of our soul moves us. He that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth, and which also beareth fruit. You have to be willing to let God open your eyes you can't be close-minded to the truth. You have to have a willingness to be able to think outside the box and accept the truth of, of God and his word, even when it doesn't make sense to you, even when it doesn't compute with you and your experience and your background and your education. You have to be willing to think outside the box. You have to be willing to have your eyes open. You have to be willing to have your ears open. You have to be willing to hear from God. Are your eyes upon open to Christ or are they only open to your religious traditions? Verse 16. But blessed 
are your eyes, for they see. Let's stand for prayer.